Okay, so I told there were two definitions of what a monad is. One inspired from category theory, sort of the classical one, where you work with um, the unit of multiplication. The other one where uh, that also comes from category theory, where uh, multiplication is replaced with something called uh, uh, Claisley extension. And that is the one that we work with in Haskell. And then I started to, uh, to show a few uh, uh, examples. Um, and we didn't get very far uh, with those. And this is where I'd like to uh, continue now. Uh, so um, <clears throat> we talked about exceptions. And then I started to, uh, to explain some other examples. We already went over reader monads, writer monads, state monads, and list monads is where I stopped. So let's recapitulate quickly here. Um, list monad. Um, the standard one um, has then as the underlying functor, the list functor. So T of X is lists over X. The unit uh, takes a value and turns it into a singleton list. And intuitively, uh, uh, lists represent multiple outcomes from a possibly non-deterministic computation. But of course, a singleton list is the special case of non-determinism, which is actually determinism. In this particular case, there is exactly one answer. So, um, you know, you somehow see determinism as the as the very basic special case of non-determinism. And then finally, mu was about uh, flattening computations of computations into computations simpliciter, uh, intuitively corresponding to sequencing computations or stop substituting them into each other. Here in this case, we're given a list of lists and the result is their flattening or concatenation. The idea being the outer list uh, corresponds to uh, uh, sort of multiple outcomes from a first computation in a sequence. And then the inner list, uh, inner lists in the bigger outer list they give you the outcomes of, uh, uh, of the second computation uh, or these multiple alternative sec uh, second computations in a sequence. Uh, uh, so overall, we've got a choice, an outer choice between lots of inner choices and all of these are concatenated together. We get, uh, we get a list. Then I commented that actually, this is not the only monad structure um, on, the, on the list monad, there are, there are others. This is a, the simplest one of those, which modifies the standard list monad very little. Um, so the only difference is uh, in multiplication, the default case is also concatenation. So you just flatten a list of lists together into a, a simple list. But you first check if possibly there is any inner list that is empty, in which case uh, the whole result uh, will be empty. But there are more list monads. Some of them are very crazy. Not, of them, not all of them even uh, have, the, uh, have the unit as singleton, for example. <clears throat> OK. I'm sorry. Can I ask about this second sure. list monad? on the previous slide so Go can ahead. we interpret think about this empty list here as a kind of ex exception so if any of the computations inside the list throw an exception i.e empty list we replace the whole thing with an exception as an empty list um, that's that's absolutely correct this is somehow the intuition here indeed and you would you would wonder why is this only applying to inner lists according to the definition here? But then of course, if you think about it, it also applies to the outer list because if the outer list is empty, there can't be any inner list and uh, you know, the, the whole result is empty anyway, just by the second clause. So this is a bit hidden here, but indeed, um, um, this is kind of a, of a model where, uh, where indeed you, uh, you think of uh, you know, absence, um, of an option someplace as kind of an exception that is propagated out of the whole thing. So, I mean, if you've got multiple outcomes uh, from the inner computation, 
but the uh, one of the so from the outer computation sorry but then one of the inner computations uh, fails to produce a result this somehow uh, uh, affects the um, the the overall uh, in that this exception is is propagated out in a way uh, actually this becomes clearer when we start to look at algebras of monads which correspond to handlers then uh, we think, uh, I, I won't spend a lot of time in this course talking about algebraic operations, which is a big topic, but, but really these two list monads correspond to different algebraic theories. Maybe I should mention this uh, just, you know, uh, kind of informally on the side here. Uh, it won't help all of you, but maybe it will help some of you. So you can think um, of the list monad as corresponding uh, Uh, to, the al to, to the algebraic theory of monoids, where uh, uh, monoids are determined by two operations, uh, um, a constant and the binary operation, or a nullary operation and the binary operation, and the binary operation has to be associative and uh, unital with respect to the nullary one. So in the case of list, you could think these computations actually arise from binary choice and nullary choice, uh, and then uh, uh, just imposing associativity and unitality. So you say, you know, you can make a choice between A and B, uh, but then maybe in the B case, you can make a further choice between two other things. In the end, you can flatten it down into a choice between three things and that is happening in a list. So it's, it, it, the, the operations here, the basic operations are binary choice and nullary choice. And in this, Interpretation, nullary choice is kind of a futile choice. Nothing comes out, but it doesn't contaminate the whole uh, overall co uh, uh, computation. Uh, if some uh, computations among many inner ones that you have produce nothing, it doesn't matter because the whole thing could still produce something, right? So this is the algebraic theory of monoids that corresponds to this monad. That's very informal. We'll get to there more precisely. But this one is not it doesn't correspond to the algebraic theory of monoids. It actually corresponds to the algebraic theory of semigroups with zero. So in a semigroup with zero, you also have a nullary operation and the binary operation. And the binary operation is associative, which here corresponds to like making one binary choice. And then uh, in one of the cases, making another binary choice, you actually get a choice between three things and how you bracket those doesn't matter. It's, it's a flat list of three elements at the end of the day, but uh, the nullary operation is not a unit with respect to the binary operation, but it's a zero. So it cancels out uh, uh, the other argument. Uh, so if you apply the binary operation to two arguments, one of them being the nullary operation or constant, the other being whatever, the result is again this nullary operation. And uh, this gives rise to this list monad. Uh, now this construction is, is, is very, very general. Uh, I also want to show the code next to it, so uh, you, you will recognize it. Uh, it is about um, uh, the monad of free algebras of a functor, also called the free monad. Uh, there is a tiny difference between them in general, but here maybe we can even ignore it. Um, so it is a monad parameterized or I mean but the monad is not parameterized but the construction of, of this type of monad is parameterized by some given functor f so you start with a functor and then you actually produce a monad out of it um, with this construction let me explain the symbolics here <clears throat> so um, Um, so this is really about leaf trees. T of x is the least fixed point of x plus fz, which you can simply think of tx being the least solution. This is indicated by the little mu here. It just stands for the least fixed point. It has nothing to do with the multiplication for the monad that we also call mu. Tx has to be an object isomorphic to the co-product of x and f of tx, or the type tx has to be the same as either x or f of t of x. 
Now, let me tell you what this is. These are really leaf trees. A tree with leaves labeled from, uh, with leaves labeled with values from X is what? It's either a leaf, in which case the information you need to uh, record is, is this leaf label, or it is not a leaf, it is a branching node. So in this case, uh, the functor F is used to determine how the branching happens. So any functor gives you some sort of a branching factor, if you wish. And then what do you have in each uh, child position is a tree again, recursively. And that's what the tree is, right? It's either a leaf um, or it's an inner node where the children again root uh, trees recursively. So the unit here, um, and maybe I should comment on one thing, in stands for, uh, uh, for the initial algebra structure here. So it is this, uh, this here is a type isomorphism. In is the one that converts from the right to the left. And you don't have to need know more about it if you haven't heard this before. So people talk about equi-recursive solutions for type equations and iso-recursive. So here, this is iso-recursive. The left-hand side is not literally equal to the right-hand side, but it has to be an isomorphic type. And then this isomorphism from the right to the left is called in here. Inl and inner are left and right injection as before. So eta x is um, you inject the value to the left and then uh, consider it uh, as a tree. So it literally just turns a value into a tree that is just a leaf. And mu takes in a tree. Here is a sort of a pattern match. <clears throat> so if the tree is a leaf at which another tree has been grafted, because we've got a tree of trees, it just returns that tree. In the other case, you just proceed homomorphically, you just uh, recurse. Uh, um, uh, at, uh, at the children. And the net effect is the tree is flattened. You, you've got a tree with leaves labeled with trees. So it's like a computation of computations. An outer computation is a tree, but all these inner computations uh, in the leaves of these trees are also trees. And a tree over trees is flattened into a tree. Um, now this may be a bit abstract for a general F, but the for example, one particular case is take f of x is x times x. Then uh, this construction here specializes to this. And what is it? t of x is um, the least type z such that z is isomorphic to x plus z times z. And these are exactly binary leaf trees. So a binary leaf tree is either a leaf together with the label on it or recursively it's, uh, um, or, or, or I wanted to say, or it's an internal node, in which case the, 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 the relevant data are just recursively two trees, you know, the subtrees rooted at these children nodes. So now we are in a funny situation because I told you um, I can use lists to model non-determinism. And I can see all of the outcomes of a non-deterministic computation in a list. Now I'd like to tell you, you can model these kind of trees also, or, or you can use these kind of uh, trees also to model non-determinism. But that's a different notion of non-determinism where you can observe choices. a bit more. The, the branching represents the choices made? The bran the, exactly, the branching represents the individual binary choices made, right? Right, thank uh, you. So that's, that, that's the whole point here. So. Um, um, in, in this compute, uh, sorry. Why, why? Mm. Wrong direction. So in this construction, uh, <clears throat> uh, we talked about non-determinism and the individual choices are not visible, right? We just see basically, if you wish, the frontier of leaves of the type of trees that I was talking now most recently. So this notion is more abstract. So we, we cannot see the little choices that are made to reach outcomes. The only thing that is recorded is kind of the left to right order of these outcomes, if you 
see what I mean, and also the multiplicity of outcomes. Like if some answer comes out multiple times from a non-deterministic computation, you don't forget that this happened. You see it in, for example, this list multiple times, right? Yeah. So this tells you that there is several levels on which you can model non-determinism uh, non and that actually generally uh, tends to apply to effects. I mean, you can go more extensional. So you, you try to go as abstract as possible and this list X thing is quite abstract or you can be very extensional or, or concrete. Uh, use the wrong word. <laughs> I wanted to say you can be very extensional or abstract. So you only see the you know, kind of end result. Uh, uh, or you can be intentional and concrete. So intentional means that you actually see, you know, what the what happened inside the computation. You see the, um, um, yeah, you see the details of it. Uh, now, I suppose many of you would actually guess that there is more things that we could do, right? Uh, so how could I go more abstract? So if I didn't, for example, even want to know in which order my outcomes are in the tree. What should I represent the lists? Uh, set, sorry, which should I replace multi -set. lists with? Set or multiset? Set or multiset? Yeah, exactly. Set or multiset. So if I want to forget about the left to right border, I could represent this. Uh, uh, sorry, I could replace lists with multisets, right? And that will be a monad. So the singleton multiset is the unit and union of multisets, which properly you know calculates the uh, multiplicities. Uh, this union of multisets is multiplication. And then we could go to sets, which also then forgets the multiplicity, right? So there is several levels on which you could work. Lists, then these multisets, also known as bags, or, 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 or finally sets, right? And then these trees are, are the most uh, intentional or concrete one in this particular case, of course. Uh, um, what else did I want to say? In Haskell, we typically stop at lists. Why don't we do multisets or sets? Because it's trouble, right? <laughs> uh, in, in Haskell, we have inductive types, but we don't have these quotient types where you want to say many lists are equivalent or something like this, and we want to work with these equivalence classes. I mean, I could somehow insist on an invariant that no element may occur in a list multiple times, but I cannot express it on the level of types, as you know. I could in a dependently typed language, but not in Haskell. So it would be an invariant I need to keep in my head, but that I cannot express. And it's worse, of course, with sets, because there the order shouldn't matter. So um, I could canonize. Um, uh, a list representation of a set if, if the underlying type is ordered. So for example, if I work with uh, with a set of characters, I can put them in the alphabetic order. If I work with, with some set of numbers, I can, I can order by the less than. But the trouble is <laughs> uh, we want to work with these monads that uh, have to send any type of values to a type of computations. And there is, you know, an arbitrary type doesn't come with any notion of canonical order. Uh, so that just doesn't work like this. Uh, um, Okay, there were some questions. Do least fixed points mean initial objects in the category of T algebras, F algebras? Yes, absolutely. This is what Ben Lodgson asked. Uh, if every monad can be considered as an initial algebra, that's not true. But this type of monads that we're talking about here, they are indeed special because they, uh, they really develop, uh, deliver, for every X they deliver an initial algebra of a particular functor here, x plus f blank. Um, these are called also free algebras. Um, a question, you said that the in is an iso, is it unique or take a canonical one? Uh, <clears throat> uh, when you construct, uh, when, you, when you have some initial algebra construction, you will get a canonical isomorphism here. Uh, in general, these types can be isomorphic in, in many ways, but only one of them will be the structure map uh, of Tx as an initial algebra carrier of that functor here. Uh, okay. Um, I'm always confused about least fixed point. It seems to th suggest there are other fixed points. What are other fixed points? 
Well, um, the other typical fixed point would be the greatest fixed point. Um, you know, if you do it in officially in category theory, uh, then uh, this corresponds to final co-algebras of functors rather than initial algebras of functors. Um, in type theory, we tend to call these things co-inductive types. So least fixed points are initial algebras or inductive types. Greatest fixed points are uh, final co-algebras or co-inductive types. I can't get into this topic in any depth in this course because it's simply not the subject, but we'll be happy to, to answer questions. I should say there are other interesting fixed points. So something that is often around and that makes perfect sense to talk about in sets is um, rational or also called regular fixed points. So think, for example, of, um, of these leaf-labeled binary trees. The least solution is finite leaf-labeled binary trees. The greatest solution or the greatest fixed point is leaf-labeled binary trees that are non-well-founded. So with infinite, infinite paths are allowed. And then this rational fixed point corresponds to those non-well-founded trees that you can actually compact, if you wish, into finite trees with back edges. So, uh, uh, or, or cyclic trees. So uh, uh, you could, so, so officially these are non-well-founded trees, but you can see them as unwindings of finite trees with back edges. And this is, of, of course, a very typical notion of infiniteness that we want to work with in, in computer science, right? Infinite objects that you can actually represent finitely. OK, is this good? So let's do this in Haskell as well. Now I want to share differently. Um, what do I want to share? I want to share this. Now you see a bit too much, but uh, uh, that is okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I have this thing here. Um, so these are these free functor algebras monads. So T of X is really defined as the free algebra of the functor F on X. And the initial algebra of a functor F would be the free algebra of, a, of, of the functor F on the empty set. So that's the case where you just disallow uh, leaves. Uh, it's a special case, x equals 0. Uh, now, this was the code um, in category theory. That's the code in Haskell, just to uh, make sure we're on the same page. In Haskell, you can't make a difference between inductive and co-inductive types, or initial and final co-algebras. Actually, the category Hask, if you wish, is what is called uh, algebraically compact. So initial algebras and final co-algebras coincide. The difference between uh, inductive and co-inductive vanishes. That's because uh, the, you know, uh, mathematically the model is, is less theoretic and more domain theoretic, but we won't go into any of these details here. But just for you to know. But, but I can use Haskell sort of intuitively and I can keep an invariant in my head that I want to have the trees I define as finite you know, well-founded, not non-well-founded. And then there is two cases. Either I've got a leaf or I've got a node. And at the node, I've got this structure, which is F applied to a tree of F of X recursive. So it's exactly this equation here. That's an instance of functors, but it's also an instance um, of, of monads, provided F itself is a functor, of course. So the unit is, uh, is the leaf case. So this in in is precisely luf, <laughs> and multiplication works with luf and nut, which are in in and in inr respectively. And I do exactly as was described here. So when I write category theory, uh, then instead of f map for a functor f, I just write literally f, and then you can see the code is exactly the same. <clears throat> and then you can instantiate. It. Could you explain this last part once again, please, if, if you don't mind? Uh, which which one? This, this last map is just yeah. the same as the capital F here, nothing else. No. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so one so question. Because but, in, in category theory, it's completely standard to overload what the functor does on objects. So for example, okay. here, F takes Z to FZ. But here, 
uh, I'm talking about this F map thingy. So I'm applying uh, the map mapping part of a functor to a particular map here, mu, which is also happening here. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what, what is not clear is if you look at the data tree effects, so shouldn't we, I mean, where is this, what is this extra small f doing on the, uh, I mean, if you look at the uh, free algebra. The extra small of, f, oh, the extra small f is the capital F here. Um, here I sort of kept, I mean, the, the parameter f is, is everywhere here. It's never varied, but in the Haskell code here, I have to be explicit about it uh, because I want to define it once and for all for every possible f. Um, and the syntactic conventions of Haskell force me to write small f here, and uh, it's standard to write capital F here. In Agda, you're, for example, free yet to choose notation that would very closely to match this one here. But I in see. Haskell, you can't. Yeah, because that, that part is, I, I have to say, it's not very clear what's happening between what the translation is right now, at least for me. I don't I, know what it is. I would say it's exactly. Um, <laughs> There is, a, there is a precise match, except that you should think that this capital T maybe carries a little index. Uh, okay. Sm uh, I mean, capital F, that it's parameterized in F. This is what is happening. Tree of okay. F okay. is literally okay. the capital T here. There is no- Okay, huh. all right, that makes Look, sense. For example, here it says F of T of X, here it says F, and then not of T of X, but tree F of X. Yes. And here I'm saying, uh, for example, that T is a functor, now I'm saying 3F is a functor, or I'm saying that T is a monad, now I'm saying 3F is a monad, so. Okay, so the 3F and the F are essentially two different objects. The 3F on, in your Haskell code corresponds to the capital T, and the small f in your Haskell code corresponds to your capital F in your uh, free algebra is monad thing, is it? Yes, that makes sense. That's absolutely correct, but there That's is correct. more overloading. So for example, this <laughs> little f has nothing to do with any of that. <laughs> okay. It's just a name for an arbitrary function. Um, okay, fair enough. Yeah, thank you. But that, but, that but last remark is in types are the capital F here. Uh, right, right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, and you can always work with these things on the level of this generality, but we could also, of course, work with instantiations. So, so here, for example, I wrote out exactly the same construction for just binary branching. Here, I call it intentional non-determinism. So the trees here in in D is just um, ND is non-determinism and I stands for intentional. <laughs> so this is a monad. Um, if you apply it to X, um, then uh, the type is X plus um, T of X times T of X. Um, so uh, in category theory, I would have these constructor names in inl and in inner. Here I'm just calling them intuitively root for return and uh, colon dollar for for, for for the choice for pairing of two possible uh, computations. And we can see that this is monad by writing out the instantiation, but it's literally a special case of the more general one here. So in particular, one could recover I and D as a special case where F you put the particular thing, I, I think it's even written out, but I'm not sure how far down in the code. So let's not go deeper into this. Here is another typical one, the continuations monad. <clears throat> Um, so this is for the case, sorry, this is for the case, again, when I have uh, expon exponentials or function spaces around, and um, uh, you fix some object R, or in Haskell thing, type R of answers. I think the letter R maybe stands for results. <laughs> and then T of X is defined as X arrows R arrows R. And the idea is what? You think of R as sort of the ultimate result from someone's perspective of your computation. And uh, a, comp you know, a computation really then is a dependence on the result of the result on how you would carry on from the particular um, uh, value. So, um, so it is, a construction that allows you to model, many people call it the mother of all monads. For, for, uh, and there are also technical reasons why it is important, but this is how you work with it. So the unit takes a value and it has to embed it um, in a type like this. And it, this is done with this code. 
So given a little x in capital X, given a little k uh, in this function space here, all I need to do is to apply the function k to x and I do get an r. A multiplication is more complicated. Um, and uh, this here is not the right type. It's copied uh, uh, fr from a different slide. This is actually the definition of bind. So for a given f, where f is um, from x to y, uh, you can go from, uh, from y to x, you can go from t of y to t of x. I'm sorry for the typo. Uh, yeah, there was more on this slide before. Uh, <clears throat> so that's an example. I should say there is a version of it to which I need to come. So therefore I briefly mention. So I made some fuss yesterday about strong monads and I said there is a difference between functions in set and functions in your category and uh, this also actually gives rise to two different versions of the continuations monad uh, in general. So this is one of them where everything happens inside the category. You use the internal function spaces, this double arrow. But you could also imagine another thing. We could say, um, I consider all possible maps of C from X to R. And then I take this thing that is called uh, the power um, of this set and R. And this is what? This is officially just uh, the, the product of R as many times, R with itself, as many times as there are elements in this set. So the general definition of I pitchfork R is the product of I many copies of R. So literally just this. You've got some indexing set i, and I take i copies of r, and it's all the same copies, so there is no variation here. And truly, these two should be the same in set because is that essentially r r raised to the modulus? Of, I mean, r raised to the cardinality of i. Essentially, that exactly yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, assuming it, it, assuming the cardinality is finite or countably infinite, right? Uh, I mean, this, the, your, uh... well, here, all you need that this is, uh, well, it depends on what, uh, what, what kind of products exist. So, I mean, if you can index over arbitrarily large sets, so if, right. if all products, all small products uh, exist, then, uh, then this only needs to be a set and you don't okay. worry about uh, cardinality, but you could, of course, more specifically ask about, uh, require smaller cardinalities. Yes. So in the case C set, the two monads are exactly the same, but the difference will actually uh, ma manifest at one point. Thank you. Thank and then I should go back, I'm almost through with these slides. I should go back to one slide that I jumped over last time. So let's um, quickly recall what the Kleisley category was. Um, a Kleisley category of a monad was this place where officially types and impure functions live. So if C is your category of types and pure functions, so for example, set or hask that you start with, if we call hask the category of all Haskell types and functions, then Kleisley of T has exact the same objects, so intuitively types, but then a map between two types X and Y is not a function between X and Y in the sense of the category C, but is actually a map in the sense of category C between X and T of Y. So it's impure functions, functions that take a value, but return a complicated computation of values. So for example, at a binary leaf tree, if it's, if it's uh, about non-determinism, right? Um, uh, and what was the, sorry, wrong direction. So uh, yes, as I said, so the objects are the same as in the base category. A map in this Kleisley category is the same as a map in the base category from the same source, but as the target you use, not the given target, but T of it. And then identity is, may, is constructed from the unit of the monad and composition is constructed from the multiplication or Kleisley extension of the monad. And it allows you then to compose together these maps in the Kleisley category. I indicate this with this small superscript T just to make sort of clear that here I talk not about the maps of the base category, but of the Kleisley category. And then I said, there is a little more. There is a functor actually that goes between C and Kleisley T. So this has to 
be a functor like a functor always. It has to send objects to, to objects, maps to maps. On objects, it doesn't do anything. It sends every object back to the same object because the two categories share the same object sets, but, um, or object collections. But on maps, what it does, a map uh, F from Y to X in the base category is sent into a map from Y to X in the Kleisley category, which of course read in terms of the base category will have to go from Y to T of X, which you can do by first applying F, then eta at X. And this is a functor from C to Kleisley T. What I didn't say is you can also go in the backward direction. So there is also a way to go from Kleisley T back to C. Call this functor R. Uh, what does that do? Um, so this is defined differently on objects. It is just T. So R of X is T of X. Just as a mnemonic, R is standing for reverse, right? Essentially. R is actually standing for right. <laughs> so this oh, right. is gonna be a left adjoint. Sorry, R is gonna be, a, uh, the whole thing is gonna be an adjunction right. uh, between the two functors, but R is the right adjoint here and J is left. Actually, this was my next <laughs> item that you can already see here. That's the mnemonic. Uh, but then when you apply R to a map in, in the Kleisley category, which actually in the terms of base category is goes from Y to TX, then because how we map objects, R of K has to go from TY to TX, but we've got the means to do so. So given, given a map K from Y to T of X, of course I can use its Kleisley extension. So that's, that's, um, that's a functor from Kleisley T to C. Now, the two functors are adjoints. This is often depicted like this. So you write down the two categories, you indicate the two functors as maps between the categories. And you put a little T symbol uh, uh, pointing to the, toward the left adjoint. Uh, uh, and then <clears throat> what does it really mean to have an adjunction? We won't talk about them a lot in this course, but intuitively it's, it's about bijections between maps in two different categories, in the two different categories involved, uh, using then, uh, compared then using these two functors. So I take an arbitrary object Y in C, and I take another arbitrary object X in Kleisley T. And then two things have to be the same, maps from J of Y to X and maps from Y to R of X. And when I said the same, I really mean in a bijection, not literally the same. Here actually they happen to be literally the same. And <laughs> where does this left, left and right talk come well, you put the left adjoint here on the left, <laughs> here. So I'm, I, I've got a map from left adjoint applied to Y to X has to be the same as a map from Y to right adjoint applied to X. So the right adjoint here in this picture ap appears on the right in the below type or, yeah, of, of maps. And the J appears on the left in the above type of maps. <laughs> Now this adjunction is very specific, namely, if you go first this way and then this way, you get some functor that goes from C to C and that functor happens to coincide precisely with T. Yeah, so you could see T as, a, a, sorry, you could see the adjunction as a factoring or people also call it as a resolution of T. Yeah. Um, yes. So let's calculate <laughs> R applied to J applied to X. J was identity on objects. So J of X is just X and R of anything is just T of that anything. So R of J of X is T of X. So we see on objects, this composition holds. This should also hold on maps. So I start out uh, with a map F from Y to X in the category C. If I first apply J to it, then R, what happens? J applied to F gives me eta after F and R further applies Kleisley extension to it. Um, and then you can calculate that this is nothing else than uh, T of F. This follows from, uh, from the monad laws. Or actually, if you start with a Kleisley triple format, this is even the definition of 
the functorial action of T on maps. And moreover, the adjunction is also special in that the unit of the adjunction, and I haven't told you what that is, uh, coincides with the unit of the monad. Now, this picture will repeat, uh, and this is why I uh, said this was important. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, let me then tell you that in general, any adjunction gives rise to a monad. So we saw one special case where uh, I had a picture like this. I had two functors that were adjoint between two categories. One of them was C. The other one was Kleisley T for some monad T on C. You can actually start with any adjunction whatsoever. And if you compose the two adjoints this way around, first L then R, like here. Remember in mathematical notation, always what you do first is actually on the right and what you do next is on the left. So this is kind of the tradition of uh, mathematical uh, function application and also function composition notation to which we stick. So this thing will always carry a monad structure and the, the unit of the monad will be the unit of the adjunction. And informally then, as I said, to have an adjunction means that you have a bijection between maps in D like this and maps in C like this for any object X of D and any object Y of C. Moreover, the bijection has to be natural in X and Y, which I forgot to say before, but that's important. So adjunctions so related to a monad, they are called resolutions of a monad. Um, you can actually make a category out of resolutions of, of, of a monad. So every resolution of a particular monad T uh, is an adjunction like this. And you can talk about maps between adjunctions and this allows you to then uh, yeah, make a category out of, uh, out of these resolutions. The Kleisley adjunction that I showed you before is a resolution and it's a special one in that it is the initial object of this category. So it's an object it's a resolution from which there is a unique map to any other resolution. And maps in this particular case are functors. Okay, let me show you some monads that actually arise in this way. Uh, and uh, the examples here are the state monads and continuation monads. So the state monads for S arise from this adjunction. So it turns out that for any set S, there is a junction, an adjunction between, on the other hand, the functor blank times S, and on the other hand, S arrows blank. This is the left adjoint, that's the right adjoint. Does everyone know the blank notation? So somehow category theorists are ashamed to write lambda S. <laughs> so whenever there is an expression uh, that you want to see as a function, in one particular position in the expression, you just put dash in this position, but you could just as well put some variable here, here and variable for an object and then write a lambda, you know, to abstract out this thing. So that this could also have been written lambda capital X, capital X times S would have been fine. But uh, some of the tradition is to write like this. Is that cross essentially a Cartesian product? I'm sorry, it's a naive question. Times is the Cartesian product. And okay. The double okay. arrow is always the exponential. Okay. Thank which you. actually is defined via this adjunction. So people could ask, I also commented this on Slack. So from where do exponentials come? Intuitively, they are function spaces, but they are actually defined by them having um, this relation to uh, maps out of. Cartesian product via currying and uncurrying. Yeah. So this is how, uh, how this uh, exponentials arise in the first place. But now look, uh, if you were to substitute uh, these two functors into each other, you get exactly S arrows S times blank. Well, you get S arrows blank times S, but the product is symmetric. So you can write these things whichever way you want. So the state monad, which was Tx equals S arrows S times X, is there because of this adjunction. 
actually, um, uh, and don't look at the right, uh, the thing on the right for the moment. This, uh, and similarly to there being uh, two versions of the continuations monad, there is also two versions of the state monad, but the other version only makes sense as a monad on set because you have to compose two functors this way around, not for an arbitrary category C. Uh, let me answer a question before I go on. Uh, so Endogen says, in the last slide, it was saying that for a fixed monad, all of its resolutions become a category and the class the adjunction is the initial object, right? Yes. So you fix a monad and you just look for resolutions of that particular monad. Um, and there the class the adjunction is the initial object. Of course, I mean, you could go further. You could form what is called the total category where the objects are pairs of a monad and some resolution of it, but then it's a different story, right? So that, that would be a category that contains resolutions of all monads uh, among its objects. But here we're just talking for a fixed monad. Is that good? Will Smith says he likes the dash notation. It sort of works, but it's as broken as, you know, uh, if you wish, uh, a function abstraction notation in, in lambda calculus, <laughs> because it works as long as you've got uh, one variable position around. But as soon as you start to have like multiple things, then it gets confusing and then you don't know in which order your lambdas are, etc. So uh, sometimes people write dash and then they write double dash for the second, uh, um, you know, parameter, etc. But it gets confusing. Yeah. Sometimes it's really different to, 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 to read these things properly. So of course, the only real good notation in the end is, is lambdas. Uh, <clears throat> And the gene asks, what is an example of a monad having multiple resolutions? Take the very same state monad. It has the Kleisler resolution, and it, for example, has this one. And we will actually see another one called the allenberg moore resolution. Uh, uh, that's where we reach uh, by the end of today. Is that okay? Yeah. So in general, there is, there is multiple. There is always two canonical ones. There is the initial one, the Kleisley, the final or terminal one, which is called the allenberg moore resolution, which you haven't seen yet, but it's also always there. And it's very important also for functional programming, actually. Uh, but we're not there. Uh, OK. Now, let's also figure out the continuations monad. If we can build it from some simple adjunction. And it turns out that we can. So let's remember what the continuations monad was. So t of x on the level of object, uh, sorry, on the level of objects, t of x is this. And now just memorize it, x arrows r arrows r. So this looks like a substitution of two functors into each other, right? <laughs> so somehow we've got this functor arrows black, uh, sorry, blank arrows r that I've substituted into itself. And then finally I put plugged uh, an x for the inner blank, yeah? So maybe, maybe it comes from this, the monad, uh, from substituting blank arrows r into itself. And it does. So what's the situation here? Uh, interestingly, it is an adjunction between C and not the same category, but the category C op, which is exactly the same as C, except that it's not exactly the same. <laughs> it has exactly the same object, but the maps of C op between X and Y are the same as the maps of C between Y and X. So the direction of maps changes, but it's the same maps. You just think of them having think of them as having different sources and targets the identities the identities are the same but composition will have to go the other way around so if you think you're composing one thing after another you're actually composing them but the other way around because of how we now have agreed with ourselves that we think about sources and targets or um, domain and codomains whichever is people like right why is this true so let's think about it. Um, so uh, we are saying actually that um, blank arrows R should be the right adjoint and also blank arrows R should be the left adjoint. Um, and there is a little op here for kind of bureaucracy reasons. Let's now reason a bit. So if I got a map like this, that's surely the same as a map like this because you can uncurry, you can take both X and y to the left hand side, you have x times y. Uh, 
product is symmetric, so x times y is isomorphic to y times x, and then you can carry again, then you've got a map from y to x arrows r. That's correct, right? And what I've written here on the top line is I basically want to see the same map. Um, um, as a map in the opposite category, which I indicate by this backward arrow. <laughs> so in the opposite category, any map like this actually counts as a map starting in X double arrows R and ending in Y. And now what you see is the left adjoint applied to X arrows. The arrow is, is kind of in a forward direction, but I put it backward simply to indicate that in terms of the original category C it's backward and the target is Y. So we established this uh, bijection here. The op is because X is in a negative, uh, sorry, because blank is in a negative position in upa in uh, exponentials. So this is, uh, this is why this happened. And for the other thing, uh, the, the other version of the continuations monad there, remember we had these things called powers which are just uh, a product of R with itself I many times, where I is a set. So uh, I pitch for blank is right adjoint to this home set, C blank R, the set of all maps to R from blank. Uh, and now you can see these two functors are in this left right adjoint adjunction re relationship by exactly the same argument. But here the, the other category is no longer C op, it's set op. Okay, um, what is the intuition between set op? It's the same as for C op, so it's the category of sets and functions. But if you've got a function that goes um, from one set to another, like, I don't know, from integers to booleans, you say, for me, it goes from booleans to integers, but it's still the same map. Um, <clears throat> Was it explained how to determine which monad, uh, which monad arises from an injunction? T equals R after L, but what are return and bind joint? Good question. So I hid this, right? Um, I've shown you only what the underlying functor is. It's the composition of the two things. I haven't shown you how to construct um, the unit and the multiplication. Let me do the unit for you because it's kind of easy to, uh, to explain um, without scribbling. So this is a bijection uh, um, uh, parameterized in arbitrary y and x, right? So there is nothing that actually forbids me to take x to be L of y for a particular y. Then I could plug the identity map from Ly to Ly here on the top. Yeah, that's a perfectly legitimate map from Ly to Ly in D. And what I get as a result down here below because of this bijection is a map from Y to R of L of Y, right? But, that, but R after L is T. So actually what I got was a map from Y to T of Y, which works for any Y. So that's your unit, okay? Multiplication is a tiny bit more complicated, but you can do that as well. It's a good exercise. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we're good here. Um, I'd like to do algebras, uh, um, but I feel like it would perhaps be good. We've got 20 minutes left, uh, which is not a lot of time. But uh, I would like to suggest that we take at least a five minute break and maybe go five minutes over time. Is, is that good uh, for everyone? Because we've discussed for quite a while. Uh, <laughs> no one reacts in any way. I think it's good. So let's say we take a break until 45 and then I try to be done by 05, uh, okay?
Paul or Jim, can you hear me? If someone is around, can you comment to me if... Uh... Yep, was the question? Yes, can you hear me? Sure, though a little bit more volume would be better. helpful. Uh -huh. Sorry, I was I talking to... over you. We always speak at the same time. <laughs> I wanted to ask if the sound was better this time around. Hmm? Yeah, better in terms of no hiccups. Yeah, without video from your side, it went smooth through the whole uh, experience. Oh, that's very good. And it yeah. was really a network issue. I was I was at, at a different um, uh, different Ethernet socket uh, yesterday, and I think it's connected to um, to a bad port in the switch or something like this. When I when I checked the speeds today, there was a drastic difference. Uh, so I changed the office, and I think it's much better. Uh, at least, uh, and, and I tested with someone. So I don't know what people have done. Uh, or maybe it's just there's yeah. Though there's volume of your sound is somewhat low. The volume on my side is low. I can make it better for sure. Uh, yeah, now it's much better. Thanks. Was it also very low during the? Yep. Lecture? But still oh, audible. Have... But still audible, okay. Yeah, you, you should complain about this thing. That's easy to fix. Okay. Yeah, let's let's reconvene in five minutes then. Um, right.
Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Nice and loud. Is the sound no louder as well? Uh, okay. Good. Um, <clears throat> Very good, let's carry on. Um, so this is the next topic. I want to tell you about monad algebras. <clears throat> uh, the relevance for um, functional programming, I'll tell you immediately, is handlers, effect handlers. So remember I said uh, in my introductory notes that, for example, sometimes you may want to work with non-deterministic computations. Uh, so you compose together sequentially lots of maps that uh, produce lists over different types uh, from elements of other types. And at the end of the day, then you have some list over maybe X, but you're just interested in an element of X. And then one thing you can do is, well, if X is some numerical type, you say, maybe I'm interested in the maximum, or if it's Booleans, maybe I'm interested in, uh, in the big conjunction or disjunction. So I, I mean, I, I get lots of yes and no answers, but um, for example, when you, when you learn, uh, when you study computability, you, you have this notion of non-deterministic uh, algorithm, right? Which branch uh, to test, and, and the point is to decide some problem. If any one of the branches tells you yes, uh, you say, then actually the result is yes, isn't it? This is how we treat non-determinism in computability. That's the notion of non-determinism, or that's the understanding of non-determinism, for example, when you talk about NP time. Um, <clears throat> so handlers are a way to compress effectful computations down to single values that you may want to do every now and then for various purposes. The typical property of those is they don't work polymorphically, but they work for a specific type. So to, to give a handler, and what I'm talking about here are deep handlers for the moment in the original sense of uh, Plotkin and Pretner, you have to say, what is the type of values? for which you're talking about handling. And then what is the way to compress uh, computations over values like this to a single value? So that's actually the definition. An algebra of a given monad is an object X, think a set or, or, or a Haskell type, together with a map, think a function, set theoretically or a Haskell function from TX to X which actually cannot be arbitrary. Well, in many practical applications, you, you, you uh, try to organize your life so that you don't have to uh, check conditions and I'll get to this, but sort of in the general motiv well-motivated original notion of deep handler, there is conditions that this uh, sort of handling clause must uh, satisfy. So one of the points, for example, is if you've got a computation that was actually just a bureaucratic version of something that was already a, just a single value. So think maybe you had an element of X and you turned it into a list of X's just by forming a singleton list. Then it's reasonable to require that this sort of summarization or aggregation of results should give you just back the same X. So if I want to see a non-deterministic computation as deterministic, but it already was deterministic, then it's reasonable to, to require that, that you know, nothing happens actually in this process. Is that good? Somebody asked questions. Can I come to, that, to them later? How does this jive with probability? Yes, yes, yes. You can have handlers for, for that as well. But let's, let's postpone this for the moment. Um, I haven't got so much time left. Um, so this is one quality criterion for a handler, but there is another one that you could think of. Imagine you've got a computation of computations of values that you could reduce to a single computation by sequencing. Yeah. Like think your computations in this intentional format are like trees that have values at leaves. So you've got trees where at the leaves you've got trees, you can flatten those into tree simpliciter. So that's your sequencing. 
uh, you can summarize or you can handle the computation that thereby arises. You can produce a single value from there, but sort of normal compositionality should say that it should also be okay to sort of handle gradually. So you've got this computation of computations. What if we handled the inner computations? So inside we don't have computations, but simply values. So the inner Tx has become X by me applying Txi, Xi is the handler. And then I could carry on. Now I have got, you know, the inner computations are gone. There is just the outer computation that already produces simple values. Could I then just extract one value from there? Imagine list of list of X. Here I flatten it down into a list of X and here I handle somehow. Here I handle in two stages. Think now maybe actually this map takes list of integers to integers by uh, taking the maximum. So X is a specific set here, some fixed set. And this is maximum. Surely you can calculate the maximum um, in two ways here. So I could take a list of lists, flatten it, take the maximum of elements, or I could take the maximum of the individual inner list, get a bunch of numbers, a list of numbers, and then take the maximum. And that is reasonable. That's called compositionality, isn't it? So that's what an algebra is. Uh, there is also a reasonable notion of, uh, of a map between two algebras and we're going actually toward uh, turning algebras into a category. So a map between two different algebras, so like two different handlers. So one is a handler for values of type Y, the other one is a handler for values, or actually we should say computations of type, values of type X, you know, crunching computations of type X. And then a map between these is, uh, is just a map from Y to X, such that this diagram holds. And this just says handling using these two handlers is kind of compatible. I mean, I can do some data conversion between Y and X, and it doesn't matter if I handle before or after. So I could, I could have this computation of values of type Y, which I can see as a computation of values of type X by just converting between Y and X everywhere. Um, at the end of these computations, then I could handle, or I could handle using the handler for computations over type Y, and then convert the single value in Y into a single value in X. Is that reasonable? I think it's like a very reasonable principle. Now the algebras of the monad and math between them, they form a category that we normally call LHT. Like it's another category built based on the monad, like we had T for Kleisley, now we've got LST. It's often called the eilenberg moore category. And there is clearly also a functor between them that just forgets what the handler is. Oppa, that was bad. But it remembers what the object was. So it, it takes a pair of X and Xi and just forgets the Xi. And this is a functor, okay. Similarly to, to how we had these two different definitions for a monad, we also have two definitions for what, a, what an algebra is. You can also do algebras slightly differently. And then you say, and actually this is a version that fits better with Kleisley triples rather than uh, you know, monads in the uh, standard format. So an algebra of a Kleisley triple is given by what? It's given by an object X that's similar to what we had here. But then instead of one single map from Tx to X, we actually have a family of maps, which are again uh, set theoretical functions. So any map from Y to X, I should be able to take in sets to a map from Ty to X for every Y. And this has to satisfy certain conditions. And uh, this guy is not required to be natural. It turns out to follow. And there is also like a correct version of what an algebra map is for this format. So, um, I mean, they look slightly different. So what's the intuition? Let me give you the intuition. So I already told you an algebra of a monad with carrier X is a handler of computations of values of type X and only of that type. So Xi goes from TX to X and you can directly think if you've got a computation of values of X, you somehow crunch it into a single value. That's what it does. So this, uh, this other format of algebras is morally doing the same thing. 
um, it sort of says, if you can observe, quote, quote, values of y as values of x, um, you are able to also observe not just single values of a y, but also computations of y as x. And you can convert between these two formats, especially from uh, here to here is easy because if you've got a function taking a map like this into a map like this, you can apply it by taking y equal to x to identity on x and you get back a map from tx to x directly. The other direction is a bit more involved, but also very simple. So these two are actually in bijection. So algebras of monads in these two uh, formats are the same thing. And that's again, crucially by the Yoneda lemma, which I explained in Slack in detail uh, yesterday. So there is sort of for general nonsense reasons, trivial bijection between maps like this for a fixed X and families of maps like this for every Y then, and X is fixed, but then these families have to be natural in Y. And as I said, to go in one direction, you just use, you, you plug identity here and you do get F, a map from Fx to X. In the other direction, if somebody gives you a map from Y to X, I can apply T to it and I get a map from, uh, uh, something is wrong. These Fs here should be T, capital T. So uh, yeah, if, if you're given a map from Y to x, you can apply t to it, you get a map from ty to tx. Um, and since you also have a map from tx to x, you also get a map from ty to tx. Sorry for these f's, but that's bad. Okay, let's look at examples of this. No, we don't look at examples of this. We first talk about the allenberg mora junction, which is another way to uh, resolve a monad. So we already have a category related to the base category and built out of a monad, which is this Eilenberg Moore category, Alge T, and I've got a functor that goes from Alge T to C. Um, right, somebody is laughing at me. For nonsense reasons, trivial is P category theory. Yes, of course it is. It's, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, to say this is trivial, and when I say nonsense, this is kind of self-ironic, but, but the real reason is I, I can't go into full detail of it right now, but I gave the full thing in, in Slack. So you're, you're, you're welcome to go and, and read. And this tells you what the Oneda is and how I apply it uh, ever so many times. Um, okay, but now I already have one uh, half of the adjunction. I've got uh, a functor from the category of algebras to C. To build an adjunction, I better have a, a functor in the other direction as well. Here I call it L because it's gonna be the left adjoint to, to this U. And that thing is what? It has to take an arbitrary object of C to an algebra of T. So for any object, I should be able to invent at least one handler, but I can choose which type to handle. And for a general type X, I can't, uh, uh, um, handle computation over X, but I can handle computations over T of X. Why? Because an algebra has to go from T of something to something and mu X goes from T of TX back to TX. So this then is a canonical way of handling uh, computations of computations simply by crunching them together into one single computation, which is the sequence. And then you can also uh, define the, what, what, what this thing does on maps. Um, uh, namely, it is just T applied to F, which we can verify. Of course, it's a map from TY to TX, but you can also see it as an algebra map between TY mu Y and TX mu X. And then it turns out L is left adjoint to U in exactly the sense that I explained before. And then you can calculate that U after L is T, so it is indeed a resolution. Also, uh, you have to verify that the unit of the adjunction is eta. And then this allenberg more resolution of a monad is its final resolution. Let's look at some examples. 
algebras of exceptions monads. So how do you handle exceptional computations? That should be kind of intuitive, right? Because if for some fixed x, I need to be able to get from e plus x to x, what do I need for that? Well, officially it should be a map xi that goes from t of x to x. So it goes from e plus x to x, subject to two equations, which were these kind of reasonability conditions or quality criteria that I uh, showed to you. Well, one of them will tell you that if my computation is normal, so if I'm here on the right, then I have no choice. I just have to return that element. Actually, that's also clear by naturality that in this case, there is no other choice. So really, so a, a handler has to be an object X together with a map like this, but there is, there is like redundant information here and there are these nuisance equations. Actually, the only thing that matters is how do I deal with the left-hand case? So I have to be able to, to have a map from E to X because from X to X, I can go by identity. Uh, do you see this? So, and therefore these are really the algebras. And if I put them in this form, I, I get rid of the two equations. So by definition, algebras of exceptions monad are these kind of things, an object, a map like this, subject to two quality criteria, but then you can do your manual calculation and simplification. And you see that surely you need the object, but the map, the important information in it is one of the two cases and Actually, once you know that case, uh, you can reconstruct uh, uh, the whole map and the two, two equations are automatically satisfied in this case. So these are of course, normal handlers for exceptional computations. We should know that, everybody should know that. I mean, you, to handle uh, an exception, uh, then you have to be able to, to know what was, uh, how do you deal with, with, with a case that you, you, you have an exception at hand, so a raise. Uh, was uh, was executed. If you are given a normal value, there is no worry. There is only one right thing to do. Um, how about the algebras of reader monads? You can work it out. So by definition, it's an object X. And now for intuitive, intuitive, intuition's sake, I call the structure map of the algebra get. So it should be something that takes a function from S to X and gives a single X. And then the two equations, if you spell them out, become these equations. Now it's maybe difficult to get an intuition what this thing should do for a general X, but then we have these free algebras. We should at least be able to understand what happens if X is actually of the form TX for whatever X. So then get goes from S to TX to TX. And that morally is uh, an operation that takes a dependence of a whole bunch of computations on uh, elements of S and produces one single computation. And the way you should think of it is uh, you prefix, uh, you know, a whole bunch of computations by a read action. And then based on the result of this read action, you choose one of these computations. So this is a construct that basically uh, uh, is re yeah, read followed by a computation seen as a computation. And then the, if you think of it this way, then these laws make sense uh, or conditions make sense. Let's talk about, my time is almost up, but I think I can do this example and another, and then I've more or less, yes, these, I think, there is only three slides left. So uh, <clears throat> algebras of state monads, what are they? So they are handlers for state and they are like really serious handles in the sense that they need these two very harsh quality criteria. I'll later comment a bit more on how do you do handlers practically in functional programming languages. Typically you don't do them for arbitrary monads, you do them for free monads, and then you get rid of these quality criteria or equations. You can always simplify the handlers to a format where the equations go away. And this is how you practically treat it because really in Haskell, you don't want a situation where before someone can write the handler, they have to write also a proof of two equations. Um, but yes, so th this is what it is. So if we've got this state monad, 
uh, an algebra of this monad officially is an object x together with a map xi that I here call get put because that's the intuition which goes from t of x to x and t of x in this particular case is this thing and it has to satisfy these conditions. Intuitively, this is a construction, I mean, not in the general case, but again, when x is t of x. So I'm dealing with uh, x is already a computation. And now uh, I'm talking about the situation where I want to make a computation for, from something more complicated. And it is the sequence of read, write, and then continue as prescribed from the given, uh, by the given uh, computation. So that's get put. Um, has to satisfy these conditions. That is very hard to work, very unwieldy. You can do some work, which is a bit ad hoc. And then you find out that an isomorphic structure is to have an object X together with two maps with simpler types called get and put. Uh, satisfying three equations. Uh, Paul André has termed these things mnemoids uh, or called, christened them mnemoids because we're talking about memory, right? So this is an algebraic structure for memory. And intuitively, again, in the free algebra case, uh, these are respectively prefixing a computation by reading or actually prefixing a, a bunch of computations by reading and then choosing the, you know, how to continue, which, which con computation to use depending on what you read. Whereas put is right into the memory, sorry, it, 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 it takes a computation and it prefixes it by writing a particular value to the memory. Uh, so S times TX is, uh, is crunched into T of X, which is just, you know, some computation. You'll, you'll see uh, um, in detail actually in the beginning on Monday, how this works. But, but this is what is happening here. So uh, you do some work, like you're going to find out that uh, these algebras that are complicated things are actually mnemoids and, and, and these are easier. Yeah. And finally, for lists, that should actually be a kind of intuitive maybe because I also already kind of referred to it. So officially, if I work, with an algebra of a standard list monad, that should be an object X together with a function from lists of X to X, which has to satisfy, which cannot be an arbitrary function from list of X to X, but it has to be one that agrees with the quality criteria. So if the given list is singleton, I should get back the same list uh, and also then the other criterion. So if it's lists of lists of X, I should be able to first flatten and then use the structure map or or use the structure map twice and then flatten uh, or sorry just use the structure map twice so this is a complicated thing to describe as such you can write it out what the definition means but it actually simplifies an algebra turns out to be just a monoid so uh, it's an object x together with an element well categorically we say a map from one to x in case the category is not set but otherwise just think an element and then the binary operation which have to satisfy left and right unitality and associativity so why maximum is allowed for integers is because maximum is um, is associative and um, and left and right uh, unital uh, Right. Um, so for natural numbers, you have to take the uh, the, uh, the the unit is is then zero. Uh, if you work with integers, you have to take minus infinity uh, or something. So uh, so the algebras are monoids, and the monad itself, these t x, these are free monoids. Lists are free monoids. But then when you work with the alternative list monad. Then the algebras are semigroups with zero. So they also, why is this happening? They are objects with, um, uh, or sets, uh, objects with a map from one to X or sets with an element and then a binary operation satisfying associativity. But then the element, the designated element doesn't have to be a unit for the binary operation, but both the left and right zero. Okay. Now I think this is really, 
uh, as much I can say today. I want to continue a bit on this topic. I want to actually show you uh, uh, in Haskell uh, a discussion of uh, non-determinism and, and state and, uh, and algebras for non-determinism and state. Uh, both in these standard monads, which are lists and, and the standard state monad, but also in the kind of free monad versions, which are more intentional, where you also see all the little steps, where you see like the little choices and the little read and uh, write actions, because it's important uh, to see what the algebras are in both cases and why handling works smooth in this sort of free monad setting, but is a more complicated matter for non-free monads. Um, um, I'd like to perhaps then stop here. This is almost the end of lecture two. There is one or two slides, but the really uh, missing thing that I'd like to show uh, as the first thing on Monday is, is a bit of Haskell to, to comment more on this. Um, there were two qu questions on, uh, on chat here toward the end, which I maybe still can answer. Is there a connection between monad algebras and co-monads? No. Um, I mean, of course, monad algebras and co-monad co-algebras are dual things, but I can't think of uh, like a useful connection of monad algebras to co-monads as such. So it's true that raising effects and handling them are kind of dual. Um, and you would perhaps want to think that monads and co-monads are dual and they are. So there, there is a connection in the sense perhaps that will uh, be, uh, that is the one that I will explain on, um, on Tuesday, which is interaction laws. So there is two ways to deal with effects as sort of requests to the world. One is, <laughs> you know, you say non-determinism is not my business as a, as, as a computation, as a program, as a client. The world has to deal with it. The world has to make a choice. And that's the story of co-monads, modeling environments, and then interaction laws. But the other possibility is you say, I don't want to outsource my business to anyone. <laughs> so I deal with my non-determinism myself at the end of the day on the computation side. So I just handle my non-determinism with some handler I choose. So for example, maximum for lists of numbers. So there is, there is this kind of trade off or choice of design. Who deals with your effect requests? I mean, you as a computation yourself as a client or the environment as a server. And that's the big difference between handlers and, and interaction then. And I'll come to this and that's, that's very central. So maybe in that sense, it's a very good question. Is there any relation between more families and any of this? Um, uh, I don't think so, but I may be wrong. And these were the questions. Uh, is monadic reflection connected to Handler's monad algebras? David Richter asks, yes. Um, that's a deeper question. Let's talk about it later, I have to say. Alexander Chikligin asked if, I already asked if interaction laws are related to interaction nets, was that answered? It wasn't. They are not. So it's just a coincidence of names. There may be some sort of a, I suppose you could find some connections, but I mean, uh, in, interaction laws are not inspired by interaction nets and they are, they are not directly connected, uh, no. 